Good morning. Welcome to Desert Hills Bible Church. We have a special Sunday. As believers, uh, every Sunday is special, right? Every, every day we get to serve and glorify the Lord is special. But Reformation Sunday is one of those special Sundays out of the year that we get to reflect just how God has used many men and women throughout the ages to share and spread his gospel, especially the individuals during this period of the Reformation. I think all of us are familiar with the five solas that uh, came from this time period. Uh, scripture alone, Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, and glory to God alone. Those solas, those truths, those principles were uh, transformational then, and they still are now. But as I was thinking about these solas, these truths throughout the past week, I was uh, just reflecting on that these solas... Uh, albeit they were transformational, they weren't original to those authors. Those truths are God's eternal truth, amen? And they, those truths cannot be changed or thwarted by anyone or anything. And I think Martin Luther encapsulated the sentiment uh, best in the final verse of A Mighty Fortress, the beloved song that we're going to sing in, in just a minute, when he writes, The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever, amen? So just a couple announcements today. Uh, today, next Sunday, we'll be having the congregational, the quarterly congregational meeting immediately following second service about 12.15. Uh, during that meeting, you're going to want to attend uh, because we are going to be unveiling our site plan, uh, which is really exciting news. We just moved into this campus, and uh, God has seen fit to, to uh, direct our team to to. Uh, come up with a site plan for, for future growth and ministry. So be sure to come and hear about that. And also the Christmas boxes. I saw lots of people dropping off Christmas boxes today. Uh, if you have not dropped off your Christmas box or you took one uh, inside the, the sanctuary today, uh, you have one more week. We've extended the, the period one more week uh, for you to drop uh, those boxes off. So make sure you get all the boxes back into the church by next Sunday. If we can stand, please, and go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father God, thank you so much for this day. God, another day that we can gather together as your people and worship and glorify you. God, I thank you for this privilege. God, I thank you for the men and women you've used throughout the centuries to uh, just study your word and, and to share your gospel and spread your gospel. God, I, I uh, pray that we um, would do the same in our age, that we would be a light, a bold light to the world, that we would go and, and share the good news, your truth of the gospel to those around us. God, be with Dr. Schreiner today as he uh, preaches your word. God, be with the musicians, be with the members of the choir. God, I pray that everything we do say and think today in this service that it would be honoring to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's sing a mighty fortress.
heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. I think one of the most profound things that can happen when we gather together as believers on a weekly basis on Sunday mornings is that we can all have our focus, our heart, our affections, our attention re-centered and refocused on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And that, um, that in and of itself can um, get our mind off of the, the struggles, the trials, the burdens that we face um, in life. The things of earth grow strangely dim when we turn our eyes upon Jesus. In Ephesians 1, starting in verse 18, it says that I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power, and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all so let us continue to worship as we sing about the great hope that we have in and through the completely finished work of christ on the cross on our behalf How I love the voice.
are physically able, please remain standing for the reading of God's word. And take your Bible, turn to the book of Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5 verse 12. We'll be reading Romans 5, 12 through 21. If you do not have a Bible with you this morning, we have you covered. There is one in the pew rack in front of you that you are welcome to use. And if you don't own a Bible, you came this morning and you don't have a Bible to read at home, you're welcome to keep that Bible as our gift to you. We certainly desire for each person to have a copy of God's Word that they can read at home and study on their own. So that would be our gift if you don't own a Bible. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. At the Reformation, one of the great truths that was rediscovered and, and uh, emphasized was the meaning and significance of our union with Christ through faith. And that through our union with Christ, we have his very righteousness imputed to us, counted to us as what makes us right in the sight of God. The reason that God can declare us to be righteous is because Christ's obedience has been credited to us through faith as we are united to him. And in Romans 5, 12 through 21, we see Paul explain how this works. Everyone in Adam gets Adam's sin. And everyone who is in Christ gets Christ's righteousness. Follow along as I read from God's word. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God. And the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one... Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners... Even so, through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can be seated. Would you bow with me and join me in prayer this morning? Father, we come before you and we recognize our sin. We recognize that all in Adam are sinners and guilty before you. Father, we have sinned in thought. We have sinned in word, we have sinned in deed, we have sinned in our motives, even our best works are tainted by sin. And yet, Father, we read in your word that in Christ we are justified, we are declared righteous, though we are sinners not because of a righteousness that we have achieved, not because of a righteousness we have merited by what we have done, but simply because of your grace, 
through faith which unites us to Jesus Christ so that his very obedience, his righteousness is credited to us. And we stand righteous before you in him. Father, we praise you this morning that you have sent your son who grew up and was perfectly obedient to your will as a child, as a young man, as an adult, and every word that he said and every action that he took and every thought that he had, the motive for every single moment of his life was filled with obedience to you. Father, we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ is undefiled, holy, separate from sinners, that he is Jesus Christ, the righteous one, obedient in every way to you throughout his life, a perfect obedience, an obedience that was on our behalf, a righteousness not that he needed for himself, but that we needed because of our sin. And his obedience did not stop in his life, but continued to his death. That he was obedient even to the point of death, even a cross death, this most horrific, tortuous death, where he obediently went to the cross, bore our sins in his own body, took the curse, became a curse for us, died in our place. He was buried, and on the third day, he rose again for our justification. And Father, we praise you for this righteousness this righteousness that is outside of us and stands in heaven before you on our behalf even this morning. We thank you that you made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness that you require in him. And Father, I pray that as we celebrate these truths today as we are reminded of the glory and the joy of our union with Christ and that our standing before you is not due to our works but his work on our behalf. Father, fill our hearts with gratitude. Fill our hearts with joy. Lord, help us to see the weightiness and the fearfulness of what it means that sin abounded in our lives. Lord, help us to recognize that we deserve your judgment because of our sin. But Father, only so that we might feel the joy and relief and gratitude that comes as we are reminded by the gospel that that judgment was poured out on your son in our place. And help us feel the sweetness of the joy of our salvation, that we have eternal life in him. Father, I pray for any here this morning or any who are watching this on the live stream who do not know Christ, who are still dead in their sins, who are in Adam under your condemnation. Father, I pray that you would open their blind eyes. I pray that you would give life where there is death. And that you would grant them the repentance that leads to life. Set them free from being captives of the devil who are doing his will. And bring them to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in his name and for his glory. Amen.
Well, what a beautiful ministry that is to us each time the choir sings. And what a great reminder this morning that our Lord has not come to burden us, but to give us rest from our burdens. What a gracious Savior we have. This morning we have the great privilege of having Dr. Thomas Schreiner with us to open God's word for us this morning. Uh, Dr. Schreiner was one of my professors in my PhD program at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He is the James Buchanan Harrison Professor of New Testament Interpretation and a professor of biblical theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And he also serves as the Associate Dean of the School of Theology at Southern Seminary. He joined the Southern faculty in 1997 after serving for 11 years on the faculty at Bethel Theological Seminary. And he also taught New Testament at Azusa Pacific University in Southern California. Uh, Dr. Schreiner has written numerous books, including the commentary on Romans in the Baker Commentary series. Uh, he has written a biblical theology called The King in His Beauty. And just recently, most recently, has released a new commentary on the book of Revelation, also in the Baker Commentary series as well. Would you give me, uh, would you help us welcome Dr. Schreiner with a warm Desert Hills welcome this morning? Well, thank you for that. It's, it's been uh, such a delight to uh, be here. I was thinking while the choir was singing, I wish my wife were with me. She would have just uh, loved to be here with you. But it's such an encouragement. I, I have to say to see my good friend Toby Jennings here. That's a delight. And uh, this church has been an encouragement to me. It is, uh, it's exciting to see uh, Rob, Pastor Rob, as your preacher. So many of you have come up to me and told me what a blessing he is to you in his faithful preaching. And, you know, that's, that's encouraging to me. That's, that's why we're there at the seminary to send out pastors, missionaries, counselors, educators, and to hear how the Lord is using Pastor Rob and, and the whole church that's, that's really exciting to me. So, um, yeah, just thanks for having me in. I, I just, uh, I've just been encouraged to be with you. So my text today is Isaiah chapter 42, Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. So we'll read that text in a moment. But let's pray again first. Father, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be acceptable to you, Lord, because you're our rock and you're our redeemer. And Lord, we look to your Holy Spirit and we pray that your Spirit would come we know that if the Spirit doesn't come, our labors are in vain, that you must build the house, Lord. And we pray that you'd build up this church through your word and truth. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So my sermon is titled, Righteousness and Redemption Through the Servant. I could, I could another word for righteousness is justice, right? Justice and redemption through the servant. Um, biblical justice is needed in this world. I, I read an article recently about the city of Chicago. It could be many cities in our country, right? But it was very sobering. The incredibly high crime rate in Chicago. The, the scores of the students in the school, they, they were abysmal, the scores of the students uh, it, it, was, it was shocking. One of the things that's going on there, right, is lack, lack of justice in, in our cities. Uh, more, more and more people, they, they avoid, right, the heart of American cities because of what's going on 
in our cities. Or, 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 or if we just cast the net a little wider, we think of a country like Venezuela, if you've followed that over the years. Uh, Venezuela used to be a somewhat prosperous nation, but now, under very corrupt leaders, the, the country has been devastated and citizens are fleeing to go other places. And, and of course, this is a, this is a story of, of, of a number of countries, right? Many countries, there's corruption that's quite endemic. So we, we long for a wor world where there's, some, where there's order <clears throat> and justice. But, but then we think, maybe in moments where we're a little bit down, how's that ever gonna happen? <clears throat> and we read in this account that it'll happen through the servant of the Lord. God will bring in justice. There will be justice. There will be righteousness through his servant. But it's going to come ultimately based on his death and his resurrection. So we, we actually see in this passage today, Reformation Sunday, right, that the justice will come in a surprising way, in an unexpected way. Uh, the religious leaders didn't see it. Even, the, even Jesus' own disciples didn't understand how justice would come. Now, of course, this passage is a prophecy looking forward to the servant who would bring justice and redemption to the world. Let's read Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 9. I'm reading, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible, but you can follow along in your version. Isaiah 42, starting in verse 1. This is my servant. I strengthen him. This is my chosen one. I delight in him. I put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed. And he will not put out a smoldering wick. He will faithfully bring justice. He will not grow weak or be discouraged until he has established justice on earth. The coasts and islands will wait for his instruction. This is what God the Lord says, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I'm the Lord. I've called you for a righteous purpose, and I will hold you by your hand. I will watch over you, and I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations in order to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, and those sitting in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. The past events have indeed happened. Now I declare new events. I announce them to you before they occur. So uh, there's several things we can notice in these verses. And the first thing I want to ask is, who is the servant? Who's the identity of the servant in this passage? You know, Isaiah actually talks about the servant a number of times. But if we look at uh, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, we have a clear description of the identity of the servant. It says, but you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. So, it's clear, right? The servant, the servant is Israel, the nation of Israel. The servant is God's people. But it's complicated right? There's more to it. There are other passages about the servant in Isaiah that prove the servant can't be restricted to the people of Israel. So, if you look at Isaiah chapter 49, verse 5, we read this. I'd love to hear that flipping of pages, by the way. And now says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. Did you see what's going on there? The Lord formed his servant 
to bring Jacob back to him. But who's Jacob? Jacob's Israel, right? Is, Israel can't bring back Israel to itself. The, ser, the, the servant here can't be completely coterminous with Israel. Here we find a servant who, who restores Israel. And we know, we know from the New Testament, from the fulfillment of this prophecy, that that servant who brings Israel back is, is Jesus. Actually, that's very clear from the most famous servant passage of all, Isaiah 53. We won't read all of that, but just look at verses 5 and 6 of Isaiah chapter 53, speaking of the servant again. And we read about the servant, who is Jesus, right? But he was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. So how is he, how is he restoring Israel? He's, he's suffering for Israel's sin, right? The punishment, because this is Israel speaking, right? The punishment for our peace was on him. Of course, that's not just about Israel. It's about us too, isn't it? That's, our, that's our, good news for us too. The punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to his own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. So the servant, Jesus, died for the sins and transgressions of his people and for the sins of the whole world and for our sins. So, so justice, justice is achieved in, in a surprising way, and we'll see it again in this passage. It's achieved through, through Jesus taking upon himself the punishment, the wrath that we deserved. Something else about this passage, though. Did you know, did you know that the gospel writers, they pick up this idea of Jesus being God's servant in the story of Jesus' baptism, which we read about in Matthew 3, it's in Mark 1, it's in Luke as well. We, we, have, we have an allusion to Isaiah Chapter 42, verse 1, at Jesus' baptism. What does God say at Jesus' baptism? He says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You know, you might miss, there's a, there's a reference there to Isaiah 42, verse 1. Because what does Isaiah 42, verse 1 say? It says God delights in his servant. He's well pleased in his servant. So the baptism is pointing back to the servant passage. God finds pleasure and delight in his servant. When, when, God, when God looked on his son, Jesus the Christ, he delighted in him. He loved him. He loved him with a pure love. He loved him with a powerful love. God, God was well pleased with Jesus. Why was he well pleased? Because he was his son? Yes but also because he was obedient. Rob prayed about this, didn't he? Always obedient. Always obedient. Boggles the mind, our minds, right? Always obedient. And thought, word, and deed, and motivation. What a delight the father has in his son. And, and how the son enjoys and loves his father. You know, that tells us something about God, doesn't it? God's delight in his servant informs us. God, what does it tell us? God, when, in his relationship with his son, right, he's full of joy, full, full of thunderous and overwhelming joy. Do, do you think of God as, as fundamentally kind of crabby and, kind of, and, and, and angry? That, that's completely wrong. If you think that way. Yes, God, God does get angry God, because God hates evil. And that's because God is good. God's anger makes sense. But, 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 is, but he's full of joy. He's full of joy. And that's, that's why it's wonderful to be a Christian. I want to be full of joy. 
I want to be as happy as possible. So do you. All of us do. That's a right motivation. And we all know we're happier. Our happiness increases when we're around happy people, right? It's, it's, it's hard to be joyful around grumpy and crabby people, although God can give us grace to do that, right? But it's not easy. It's not easy. But here's the most important thing. You will be happy if you're in relationship with the one true God. If you know him, he, he brings joy into our lives. So if you're Christian, do you think God's basically mad at you? Do you think God's fundamentally disappointed in you? No. If you belong to Jesus Christ, God, God delights in you, just as he delighted in his servant Jesus. Because that passage Rob read, Romans 5, you're united to Christ. He sees you in Christ. He loves you. He treasures you. He smiles upon you. You're, you're his beloved child. At the same time, if you're known to be a negative, complaining, or unhappy person, right, that reveals your, your, your distance from God. You, you, you need to re return to him again so he can give you his joy. Notice another uh, truth in these verses. Jesus, as God's servant, is empowered by the Holy Spirit. You know, we, we, we see the work of the Trinity in these verses. Our salvation, we're, we're Christians, right? Our salvation is the work of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And, and we read here in Isaiah 42 that God gave his spirit. He put his spirit on his servant. That means he, that he, he, gave, he gave the spirit to, to Jesus. So, so we see the work of the Father in giving the spirit and the work of the spirit in empowering Jesus. We worship Jesus as the eternal son of God. And very important, Theologically, he didn't quit being God when he was on earth. He was the God-man. He retained, he retained his deity. But we should also never forget that Jesus was also a man. He's the God-man. And as a man, the New Testament regularly tells us what? The Spirit empowered him in his ministry. The Spirit empowered him to live in a way that pleased God. So when we read in Isaiah 42 that God put his spirit on Jesus, we, we have another preview, another little anticipation of what? Of Jesus' baptism. Because what happened at the baptism? The spirit came down on Jesus like a dove, which, which by the way, I think signals the new creation, right? The dove coming out of the ark, new, a, sort of a new creation, theme. So we see that the Spirit anoints and equips Jesus for ministry. Jesus' baptism indicates God's doing a new thing. The, the, the new thing starts with Jesus' public ministry at his baptism. Right before, before Jesus' baptism, he was always pleasing God. He never sinned, but he didn't do miracles, right? He didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't, no, nobody was recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, he, was, he was working at home, right? He was a carpenter. But when, when he was baptized, his ministry begins. And then what? Verse 9 of Isaiah 42, a new thing is happening. Let's look at verse 9 again. The past events have indeed happened, says I, Isaiah. What's the, what are the past events? I think... I think Isaiah is thinking of the Exodus when Israel was freed from Egypt, uh, a great event in Israel's history. But he says, now I declare new events. I announce them to you before they occur. The new event is a new liberation, a new exodus, a greater exodus. Another word for exodus is really redemption. There's a new redemption coming, and that's going to happen through the servant, 
through Jesus. There's this new exodus, this new redemption. God's going to do something new and striking. And the new things are better than the old things, as good as the old things were. And, 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 and the new thing is promised and prophesied a hundred years, hundreds of years before it takes place. No one knew when Jesus was baptized at the Jordan River in that small little country, hardly recognized in the ancient world, right? Small little country, this little river called the Jordan River. As Christians, we know about it, but otherwise people wouldn't know about it. But no one knew when that happened, right, that a new world was starting right there at that baptism. You can almost picture it in your mind, right? What a simple place to begin a revolution that would change the world. Who would think you'd start a revolution to change the world there? Go to Rome, right? Go to, go to the most prominent place in the ancient world. Not, not at this little river out in the country. By the way, what does that tell us? God works in unexpected ways and in unexpected places. Never, ever, underestimate the place you're in. Never wish, never wish you were somewhere else or doing something else to be more effective. I mean, God may move you, right? But, but, but let, let's be content with where we are. Of course, God leads us in new ways, of course, of course, but God wants to use you where you are. God can use you to change people's lives in the circumstances you're in. Your circumstances don't have to change for God to work. God, God is working out his purposes right now in your life. You know, you could read 1 Corinthians 7, verses 17 through 24. Paul says three times in that paragraph, don't think you have to change your circumstances to be effective. At Jesus' baptism, the Spirit anointed and empowered him for his ministry. Luke emphasizes that Jesus' ministry was empowered by the Holy Spirit. We, we read in Luke chapter 4, after Jesus' baptism, that he was full. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And then, and then Jesus, right, he goes, he goes into the wilderness, and what does Luke tell us? He was led by the Spirit, directed by the Spirit, governed by the Spirit to go into the wilderness. And what happened there? And he, he was tempted by the devil, and he resisted every temptation. Unlike Israel in the wilderness, right? Israel in the wilderness failed in those 40 years. But Jesus in those 40 days was led by the Spirit, and he, he succeeded. And so then Luke tells us in chapter 4, verse 14, that Jesus returned from the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. And then, then we're told in, that Jesus comes home to Nazareth and he gives a speech, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, and he says, what does he say? First, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me for my ministry. So it's, this, it's a Spirit-empowered ministry. So I say again, our salvation is the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father sent his Son to redeem us, because of his great love. The son obeyed the father as a servant. That's what servants do, right? At least they're supposed to do, right? Servants obey. He obeyed. And, 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 and he came because he loved us. And the spirit equipped the son with power. All the members of the Trinity, they work together. They work in concert and in harmony. And they work with ever flowing joy. What a great salvation we have. Planned by the Father, executed by the Son, accomplished by the Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit. A Trinitarian salvation. We're Trinitarian Christians, aren't we? Notice another truth in this passage. We're promised that Jesus as a servant will change the world. How will he change the world? He'll bring justice. The world is full of injustice and sorrow. Of course, there are good things happening in the world. So I'm talking about the bad things right now, right? There are good things happening, aren't they? But consider rape, racism, murder. 
I've, I've just been struck lately how many murders there are in Louisville now. It's just increased so dramatically. Political corruption, sexual abuse, the, the terrible evil inflicted on Ukraine by Russia, the, the, the horrific terrorism recently inflicted on Israel by Hamas. You know, those are large things. But then we can think on a smaller scale. We can think of in our, in our own communities, people, people wrongly justifying divorce and remarriage, people not telling truth, the truth to their girlfriends or their boyfriends, parents yelling and screaming at their children, and, 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 and children defying and disobeying the authority of their parents, students cheating in class and quarreling with their brothers and their sisters, people lying on their tasks, people lying on their taxes, road rage in cars. Maybe that even happens in Phoenix. <laughs> Husbands and wives arguing and arguing and arguing with one another in front of kids. And all of us trying to impress others with our bodies, with our minds, with our clothes, and on and on and on it goes. What a mess. This world is a mess. But what does this text say? Justice is coming. That, that, he tells us that several times, doesn't he? Verse 1, the servant will bring justice to the nations. It's coming. He will, he will faithfully bring justice. Verse 3. Verse 4, he will not grow weak or be discouraged until he's established justice. And the coasts and the islands, that's the whole world, right? The coast and the island wait for his instruction, wait for his law, wait for his Torah. It's coming. We'd long, I'd long for everything to be put right. It's discouraging often. Some days I just don't, I say, I'm not going to look at the news tonight. It's discouraging. There's so many wrongs in the world. But every wrong will be righted. God will rule the entire world. The world will bloom with joy when all are rightly related to God and when all submit to his authority, even those who oppose him, they will be compelled to submit. We look forward to the day when the evil things in the world will be put right. As Amos says, let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. There's a new world coming. We're promised that, right? The lion will lie down with the lamb, and the nursing child will play in the snake's pit. There'll be no pain, no sorrow, and no injustice. I, I, I'd li I like the words of the hymn, The Mansions of the Lord, which, which is written about soldiers. Maybe some of you know this song, Dying in a War. It looks forward to a new day to a day when there's no more war and no more sorrow. Here's, here's uh, what it says. To fallen soldiers, let us sing. Where no rockets fly, nor bullets wing, our broken brothers, let us bring to the mansions of the Lord. No more bleeding, no more fight, no prayers pleading through the night. Just divine embrace, eternal light to the mansions of the Lord where no mothers cry and no children weep. That's what we look forward to. But here, here's the shocking part. Here's the surprising part of this text. The way Jesus brings about justice is totally different from every other ruler in the history of the world. The kings of the world, they bring justice to those doing evil through war. That's what Israel's starting to do right now, right? How do, you, how do you respond? You, 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 you have to defend yourself, right? And the, and, the, and the kings of the world conquer their enemies. They, they smash, they destroy, they annihilate those who rise up against them. In the United States, we're very proud of our military power. I don't think that's wrong. I'm proud of our military power. We are still the greatest superpower in the history of the world. We're the richest we're the strongest nation 
You all know this, right? We're the richest and the strongest nation. Not that we deserve it, but in the history of the world. Our military, as we saw during the Gulf War, it's shock and awe. But the servant doesn't bring justice through military mind. No, notice what he says in verse 2 of Isaiah 42. He will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. We win by bombing our enemies to smithereens and by invading their cities. But Jesus didn't come as a warrior. Not the first time. There weren't, there weren't, there weren't these loud cries of battles in the streets, right? He, he could have mobilized armies. He t said that right before he went to the cross, right? He could have mobilized armies of angels that are not, like no army we've ever seen. He could, have, he could have pulverized his enemies. But Jesus didn't bring his armies into Jerusalem or Rome. He didn't come to inflict violence on his enemies, but he came to suffer and die for them. Isn't that remarkable? That is, that is, that, that's the gospel, isn't it? Such astonishing news. He brings salvation and justice and redemption by dying for the sins of the world and offering forgiveness to all who trust in him. Jesus, he's a gentle and he's a humble king. He comes to Jerusalem on a donkey, not on a stallion. Well, that's his first coming, right? The second coming, he will be coming on a white stallion, we're told in Revelation 19. He'll come with a, on a white horse with the armies of heaven. Justice is coming, first with the cross, then with the crown. But first the cross. The crown is coming later. I mean, he's crowned now, but the final crown, right? The consummation is coming. We might say, well, I can't wait for this justice to arrive. I'm, I, I'm so anxious for it. But if we think about it for a moment, the promise that there will be justice should frighten us. For if there will be justice, how will we, me and you, how will we be spared? And why should we be spared? Because we too have gone astray. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have rebelled against God's authority. We too have turned to our own way. Justice means we get what we deserve. Justice means therefore punishment, not mercy. But before justice is realized in full, before justice arrives, God offers salvation and redemption to all peoples through his servant. Look at verse 6. He says about the servant Jesus, I will appoint you. I'll appoint you as my servant as a covenant for the people and a light for the nations. The servant brings God's covenant of light, God's salvation to the whole world, to all nations, to all peoples, to every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And we read in verse 7, he came to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those sitting in darkness from the prison house. It's remarkable, isn't it? Jesus opened the eyes of those who are physically blind. You know, where I, where I live in Louisville, we're right next to a blind school. We have some blind people in our church, praise the Lord, but we haven't been able to open their eyes physically, but Jesus could do that. But he's also come to give sight to those who've who are spiritually blind, right? To those who've lost their way spiritually, to those, to those who are confused, to those who are wandering in darkness. I remember before I became a Christian, I remember feeling confused about life. What was the purpose of it? And Jesus came to free those who are in prison, we're told, imprisoned in a kind of darkness, imprisoned by our own desires. We're, we're slaves to our own desires often, right? If you're not a believer here today, Jesus came to help you really see. You may be able to see physically, but you can't see spiritually. Jesus came to open your eyes, and he came to free you from prison to liberate you, to redeem you, to ransom you. You may be in a prison of lust and sexual sin. That's a very common prison today. So many are imprisoned in that. Or a prison of eating 
too much or drinking too much or, or, or even addicted to drugs, right? Or a prison. This is a prison too, right? A prison of gossip and slandering others. Or, or maybe, maybe we're blind to the self-righteousness in our own lives. Maybe you listen to sermons, and on the way home, you talk about not what you learned and how you grew and how you were challenged or convicted, but you talk about the one thing you disagreed with in the sermon. <laughs> Jesus came to bring us out of the dark places in our lives. He came to free us from sins that imprison us and enslave us. He didn't come to destroy us, but to forgive us and cleanse us. He, he came to make us new. He came to make us what we should be by his grace. Finally, notice, lastly, Jesus gives hope to the downcast. Jesus gives hopes to the, to the, to the downcast and discouraged. Verse 3, he will not break a bruised reed, and he will not put out a smoldering wick. Uh, what's a bruised reed? A, br a bruised reed is one that's almost ruined. Isaiah ver chapter 36, verse 6, the Lord warns Israel. He says, don't trust in Egypt as your political ally. The Lord's saying, trust in me. He goes, don't trust in Egypt because they're a broken and bruised reed. And the Lord says, if you lean on it, it's just going to pierce you. So bruised reed, right? Egypt's a bruised reed. They're pretty useless. A smoldering wick, we all, we all understand what a smoldering wick is, right? The, 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 flame, the flame is about going out. It's just smoldering, a little smoke coming up, a little bit of flame. But, but it's about to flicker out. There's not much left in it. If a reed is broken or if a reed is bruised, you get rid of it, Right? If a wick is scar scarcely ridding, uh, working, you throw it in the garbage. Especially if you're trying to win a war. You want, you want good people on your side, right? You don't want, you don't want those bruised reeds and flickering wicks. But that's, that's not how Jesus works, right? He calls into the, his army those who are bruised, those whose, those whose fire is flickering low, so to speak. You know, our gospel is so different from the way the world thinks. So our, I think we're all broken and bruised reeds in various ways, but are you feeling that today? Are you feeling, I'm a broken and bruised reed. I'm, I'm not much use to God. I'm not much use to other people. Do you, do you feel that your little candle, it's so small that it would be better if it just snuffed out? Remember this, Jesus is a tender and a loving and patient and strong Savior. He has come to repair broken and bruised reeds. He has come to grant new light to wicks that are burning low or are near going out. Perhaps you've read the Puritan Richard Sibbs. He wrote a book on this, and it's called The Bruised Reed. I, I recommend that book to you. You can, you can order it easily. It's a really encouraging book. And I'm going to encourage you in another way. It's a short book. You know? You can read it. You can finish it. If, you know, if we know ourselves, we all know that we're broken and flawed beyond belief. We're, we're all more flawed. And we're all weaker then we realize, the older I get, the more I see my sins and my weaknesses. I understand better why Jesus had to die for my sins. But at the same time, I realize, I don't still see it fully. I don't fully understand the depth of my depravity. That, that's, that's for heaven, right? We'll see it the most clearly. But anyway, when we see our, our weaknesses, there, there's a danger because... For some, right, you can be close to crashing on the rocks of discouragement and depression. When, when, when we see our emptiness and our weakness, we, we, can, we can begin to think, maybe I'm not even a Christian. When, when we see our imperfections, we can begin to be discouraged and think, well, we're, we're just utter failures. We, we, we must remember that everything we do is still touched by who we are in Adam. We're not perfect reeds or perfect wicks. Everything we do is touched and flawed by sin, including the sermon I'm giving, right? Everything we do. 
But that doesn't mean that we don't belong to God. That doesn't mean that God doesn't use us, right? He uses broken and flawed people. The pastors in this church, right? They're not perfect. Of course they're not perfect. But they love Jesus, right? If you, if you want perfect pastors, join the heavenly assembly, right? Because you're not going to find it here. But there's good pastors, right, who love the Lord and who serve him. Notice, notice Jesus doesn't discard bruised reeds and start over. He loves us and heals us and is patient with us. He uses imperfect and sinful vessels for the glory of his name. Jesus is very patient with us as we grow to love him. He's much more patient and loving than our Christian friends, even our Christian friends who love us very much. Fellow believers, sometimes they get tired of us, and sometimes we get tired of them. Fellow believers sometimes get a little irritated with us, and sometimes, if we're honest, we get irritated with them. Even, right, even those who love us. And no wonder, why does that happen? Because we're still sinners, aren't we? And they're still sinners. But, but Jesus Christ, he's patient with us. He doesn't forsake us or abandon us. He takes us and he's perfecting us. He's making us more like Jesus. Verse 4, Isaiah 42. Look at this. This is a little bit technical, but I think you can follow me. We read there that Jesus as a servant will not grow weak. That, that's the same verb as the word smolder. He won't grow weak. He won't smolder. He won't be discouraged. That's the same word as the word bruised. You know, bruised reed, smoldering wick. He won't, he, he won't grow weak. He won't smolder. He won't be discouraged or bruised until he's established justice in the earth. I, I think it's fascinating to see that the verb grow weak is exactly the same verb as the verb smolder in verse 3. And the verb dis be discouraged is exactly the same verb as the word bruised in verse 3. That's not an accident. These words are, are very, quite rare in Hebrew. So Isaiah wrote this very carefully. That's the way God's word is. That's why we study it carefully. God's teaching us, your little light may be faint. Your little light may be near to going out, but Jesus isn't faint. And his work for you, it's not going to be quenched. You may feel bruised and beaten up, but Jesus is not discouraged or bruised. He'll see you through to victory. He's not a warrior who came to destroy you. He's a savior who's come to strengthen you and maintain you and sustain you. He, he loves to help the weak and the downtrodden and discouraged. So we have, we have a great hope, right? Not because we're strong, but even though we're weak, we have a strong and loving Savior. How do we know that the work of the servant will prosper? Look at verse 5. This is what God the Lord says, who created the heavens and stretched them out. How do we know God's work? will succeed. He's the creator. He made the world. If he can make the world, he's going to sustain you, right? He spread out the earth and what comes on it. He gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. He gives you a breath every second. You're alive because he gives you breath. He says, no more breath. You don't live. So he's in charge. He's sovereign. He rules. He created you. He's redeeming you. He's going to fulfill what he promised. So let's be encouraged. Justice is coming. And, and it has come, so to speak, in Jesus, hasn't it? Even now we experience it to some extent. God loves to work, we're reminded, through weakness. God loves to give life where there's death. God forgives he gives us a new start. We only have to admit, in myself, I'm weak, I'm dead, I'm flawed. We only have, need to say every day, I need help. We need only to say, Jesus, every day, 
every day. I give myself to you. Let's pray. Lord, we do give thanks for your word. What an encouragement it is to know that justice will prevail. The right will win out. Lord, fill us with that hope and optimism. Lord, help us not to be defeatist, but full of confidence that the right will win. And Lord, fill us with your joy as we know of your great love and your promise to help those who are weak and to sustain us until the end. We rejoice in that hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise for the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.